Guys, I'm very excited to call the next speaker to the stage. Really, I am excited. Uh, he's going to talk, he's going to give the closing keynote. And he's going to talk about the view from the trenches, how workhorses and unicorns fare in the real world. He is a superstar cyber. He is the sultan of cyber people. He is the king of cyber. He is internationally recognized award-winning security executive. He is Kung Fu cyber. He is the teenage mutant ninja cyber. And ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cyber himself, please welcome to the stage Iftah Ian Amit. I hate you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Probably the best intro I've gotten uh, in, in a long history of talks. Um, to summarize three days of Cyber Week is, is a daunting task. And when, when Cyber Week approached me and asked me to, to fly the closing keynote, I asked them, what, what kind of topic do you want me to address? Typically, you get asked, like, you know, talk about this or that. And they just said, go ahead. Um, you know, Pick your topic, address the, uh, address the situation. And I thought long and hard about it, and I think that um, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 minutes is, is provide some kind of closure to what's been a, probably a whirlwind of information and, and technology and startups and defenders and attackers and consultants and vendors, and maybe provide some of my own views from the trenches on the cybersecurity industry, on how we as practitioners, as defenders, are dealing with the different attacks and with the different vendors and how we're trying to fit all in and, and really make sense out of it. Uh, having said that, uh, to be able to talk about a view from the trenches, uh, I want to tell you a little story about what qualifies me to even tell you what the trenches look like. Uh, and to walk you through that story, hopefully I'm going to build a kind of a mental model for you on my experience and how I kind of build up this, uh, this context. Uh, so the story starts with, you know, long, long time in history. <laughs> uh, I used to be a pen tester, but I used to be a terrible pen tester. I mean, not that terrible, but, you know, I did all the things, I checked all the boxes, I pawned all the boxes, I, you know, I, proud, I pride myself in finding lots of obscure vulnerabilities and, you know, no engagement would end without a root or an admin on, on the target network that I was assigned to, uh, to test. I would abuse attack paths in, in a unique and, and novel way, and I would show my clients each and every way that I thought that they were vulnerable to, to myself. Uh, however, it started to dawn on me that my clients didn't really get a lot of value from that. Yes, there's the novelty of pwning all the boxes and finding obscure vulnerabilities and all that really fun, technically challenging stuff. But for them as a business, you started doubting what is the real value that they're getting out of it. And, and I was missing, I was missing a lot. And during those years uh, of myself as kind of building up myself as a pen tester, as a security practitioner, I started listening more and interacting more with, with my, my customers, the businesses, to get a better understanding of what is it that they really need and how is my work affecting their overall security posture. And over the years, I you know, kind of transformed and advanced in the field, and I became, became a red teamer and a trusted advisor to, to some of my clients, working closely with their CISOs, working closely with their executive management, building security programs, not just breaking things for the sake of breaking it, but building something to defend against something a little more real than just a, you know, a very th enthusiastic and maybe skillful pen tester but something that really applies to them as a business. And that's why I started building more models. What is the threat model that we're trying to address here? What applies to this business? You know, what kind of adversaries does a business like that actually face on a daily basis, on a yearly basis, that they need to build protections from? We started looking at supply chain and ways to get into the business and affect the business 
that are not necessarily just technical hack the box, but hack the process, hack the supply chain, getting through you know, more business processes rather than just the technical aspects. And one of the key areas as a red teamer that you learn to look for is really identify the crown jewels, what matters to the business, as opposed to the pen tester who used to get super excited about every box they pwned and every vulnerability they found. As a red teamer, you need to focus on what matters to the business. Where am I going to hurt you? Where am I going to hit you where it hurts the most? Not just hit you for the sake of saying, tag, you're it, but for the sake of saying, if I touch this, if I flip that switch, would that turn the business off? And what is the impact of that? And starting to factor in risk and impact into that work. Another aspect of it was the more social part. Again, an understanding that security is not just about the technology. It's about the processes around it, as I mentioned before, from a supply chain, but also about the people operating inside of that business. People processes, technology, starting to sound familiar, right? And those are the areas that kind of led me to grow my understanding and, and again, learn from the businesses I, I was working with, from the clients, on what does it really mean to defend the company against real-world attackers. And at that point, I started asking myself, is this the challenge? Red teaming, is that the pinnacle or the most challenging thing that I can, I can find in the security career. And it dawned on me that, and, and Evan, I think, mentioned it before, that defense is harder. It's definitely less sexier and less attractive and you know, with the fancy tools that as a, we as attackers typically use, but it's harder. And I'm a sucker for a challenge. So I took the red pill <laughs> and switched to the blue side. Um, Hopefully, I'm not confusing people with, with the color coding of, uh, of themes here. Uh, but I spent a couple of years kind of transitioning from the, the red teamer, adversarial simulation, offensive security practitioner, through the vendor side, and ended up landing, uh, at least over the past five plus years, purely on the defender side, protecting large companies. And that is truly a challenge, let me tell you. And I find myself starting to apply the opposite of the red teaming model that I had practiced and preached for so many years before that, and basically reversing it on its head. So if I were threat modeling before as a red teamer, now I'm threat modeling as a defender, as an organization. I'm trying to identify who are the adversaries, first and foremost, that I'm trying to defend myself against. I'm trying to identify what are my assets, the business assets, not the technology assets that matter to me. Those business and technology assets might have an overlap, and they often do a lot of times, but it's not a perfect match. And understanding what are the true assets that a business possesses and how to protect them and factor in everything that we talked about before in terms of people and processes and supply chain is really where things kind of started clicking for me in terms of how does it actually look or feel to practice defense from the trenches. So we started applying training and education to address the people problem, asset identification and classification to be able to say this matters more than that. The realization, by the way, for a business when they start classifying assets that not all assets are born the same is, is kind of harsh sometimes because you're telling someone, yeah, you matter less than someone else, uh, but that's just a reality and you have to prioritize, you have to focus on the things that matter. And then you start practicing the basics. Once you have that model of what am I defending, who am I defending this against, not every attack is an APT from China, Russia, Korea, whatever it is, you start calibrating and creating a better model that applies for this particular business. And at that point, the view starts to change. All of my experience with tools, with products, with vendors, started to get into a different context in terms of how well do those apply to my use case. And you start realizing 
that products or solutions do not necessarily always fit your particular problem. You start to realize that once you have a well-defined problem domain and a set of requirements, the products are generally designed to address the broad market. Now, I'm not the market. I am me. I have one business. I do not represent a, a marketplace. And that realization that products kind of miss sometimes and, and something that is perceived or is known as best of breed just doesn't work for me. And you need to start addressing that issue, if it is, or problem, and really get back to basics, really get back to having the ability to clearly define the problem and address the basic issues around it. And then reality kind of meets the fantasy, where you used to have all those fancy big unicorns, vendors, and products that are addressing a very fancy and interesting problem, kind of going back into the pen testing days of poning all the things. But as a defender, sometimes you don't have all the things, you just have one thing. And that fancy unicorn product may defend all the things, but I just need this one thing, and it doesn't really fit. It doesn't really you know, get into the right box that I needed to get into. And once that fantasy meets the reality, a few things happen. First of all, you realize, oh my god, there's a lot of basic things that work very effectively. And you, you turn back into the non-unicorns, into the workhorses that just do work, and you find those that fit your requirements, and you're amazed suddenly that I don't have to, you know, or, or I cannot even harness a unicorn into a plow because I need those lines straightened up in the trenches. You also realize that edge cases are just that. They're edge cases. You will find the problems that, that sometimes, again, I'm, I'm generalizing, unicorns try to solve in your threat model. But they're typically, or sometimes, might be edge cases. And at the end of the day, if you run your risk calculations, you just end up with, it doesn't really matter. It's an edge case. I don't need to solve this problem. I have other bigger, maybe more basic problems to solve. And my threat model is not the industry threat model. What the industry thinks that needs to be changed or addressed does not necessarily fit what I have to deal with. So going back into the industry and trying to find solutions or find problem definitions may not always work. You have to do the hard work of creating that threat model and being able to defend it to your executives, to your board, and to the rest of the company, because this is what matters to us. And the last realization is that the vendor size doesn't really matter. You can, you know, you can work with a unicorn uh, that's fantastic and it's solving you a lot of problems, but on the same note, you can work with you know, kind of an old and tired or, or just a small company that just does one thing very well. And they're not fancy, they're not you know, super advanced, but they address that basic need of solving your specific problem. And that's really where the realization that unicorns might be fun, they might be very exciting and sexy, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm actually invested in, in one of those unicorns, I want them to succeed. But the funny thing is, that unicorn that I've invested in, we don't even have them in our environment because there, it wasn't a perfect fit. And I'm okay solving that dichotomy because I'm responsible for protecting that environment. So a few takeaways from, again, from the trenches. Number one for me is really, and I'm addressing mostly the vendors here, all right? So I'm not, I'm not trying to offend any unicorns or workhorses or donkeys or whatever it is. But the first takeaway is don't be mad if someone tells you, tells you this is not relevant. One of the 
the strongest, I think, statements that a security professional can say, if they can back it up, is, I don't care. Because that means that you did all the work, that you did the analysis, that you know what you're protecting, you know where you are, you know what your capabilities are, and you can say, this is not relevant for me. Which leads me to listen. Listen to the customers, listen to the people in the trenches. You might find out that there's a problem that was perceivedly solved, but it's cumbersome. Evan mentioned before, you know, operating this tool was maybe technically correct, but cumbersome. Find those cumbersome things. That's my number three. You know, challenge the basics. Find those areas that were seemingly solved and challenge them again. And maybe a fourth kind of bonus, just to add up to, to the takeaways from the trenches. And this kind of addresses the, the more general industry issue. The last thing that you typically want to look at a vendor when you're trying to engage with them is trust. You're basically entrusting that vendor, that product, with your security. Establishing trust is hard. And as an industry, I think the, the Israeli high-tech industry has managed to go through a few hurdles in its past that were, were hurting its trust. Back from the adware days, where Israel used to be the basically number one location for adware companies, which led on to gaming and online gambling and later on forex and binary trading, all those shady problematic industries. As an industry, we managed to get past them. And now we're dealing with a new one that doesn't seem to be handled correctly right now. And it targets specifically our cyber industry, the trust in our cyber industry. And we're becoming a hotbed for less ethical, and again, Evan mentioned before, ethics and morals, for less ethical practices. And that's a problem because from the trenches, it smells bad, it seems bad. But here's a tip for you. Start rebuilding that trust. Get to the root of the problem through the supply chain. Draw it up. Have a statement that says, I'm not going to work with anyone who ever operated in those shady industries. It's going to cause a very simple uh, supply chain effect. People wouldn't want to work there because they would know this is their last job in the industry. Start practicing that. That's what I do. And I think that, in a way, together we can start reestablishing the trust by, you know, if, if governments can not find a way to stop that legal loophole of allowing companies like that to operate here, we can do it more effectively through money. And with that, thank you so much to the ICRC and Cyber Week. I hope to see you tomorrow at B-Side Steel Aviv.